Welcome to Jazz Zone Together, our new online jazz community where we will provide jazz education and classroom resources, interviews with jazz educators, artists, and celebrities, along with valuable tips and repertoire suggestions. We're so pleased to be joined today from the United Kingdom by Grammy-winning drummer Jonathan Joseph. Now I'll turn the interview over to Dick Dunscombe. Dick. Please take over. Thank you, Bob. Yes, as you said, we'd like to welcome Jazz Zone Together, world-renowned drummer Jonathan Joseph. Jonathan, it's great to see you, man. It is is awesome seeing you again, Dick, after all these uh, years. It's, yeah, we've been looking good times together. Okay, yes, absolutely. Would you give us a brief highlight reel of your performance and touring history for the people listening, please. Yes. Um, let's see. I started, um, I guess it was kind of like the, the late 80s, um, like 89. Um, this was prior to my meeting you, actually. I was on, I, my first touring gig was with Othello Molino. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you who are familiar with Jocko Pistorius, he's the steel drummer that's on you know, Jocko's albums. And um, at the same time, I was working with an R&B vocalist. Her name was Betty Wright. Uh, and they were, both these people were based in Miami, Florida, which is where I'm from. Uh, so that was kind of like my introduction to being on the road and working kind of like on a professional level and traveling across the, uh, the US. Uh, then from there, um, that was, I, I kind of did that from 89 to 93 or 94, um, I think it was sometime around 93, I started working with Joe Zivenol from the, uh, with the Zivenol Syndicate uh, after uh, Weather Report disbanded. Uh, Joe formed the Zivenol Syndicate and uh, I spent, I think it was eight or nine months, you know, playing drums in, in that band. Um, and then after, after that, I had a brief stint with Pat Metheny. Uh, I think that was 1995, and I was subbing for Paul Wertico in the Pat Metheny group. And uh, we did, uh, we toured in Japan and in, in uh, South Korea. This was a long time ago, back in 95. Uh, and then, you know, from there, I, I did various tours with various artists in various genres, uh, some of which included um, the Yellow Jackets, uh, I did a record with Randy Brecker in 1997 that won a Grammy. So that was my, my first Grammy. Uh, mm -hmm. I, have, I have two awards. One's for drumming. The other is actually for engineering. <laughs> oh. um, yeah. And then um, I worked with David Sanborn, Al Jarreau. Kind of like in the late 90s, uh, I started working with a Cameroonian bassist, Richard Bona. Uh, that was uh, a really enlightening period in, in my experience in education. And from that, I ended up writing uh, my, my book, which is a title, Exercises in African American Funk. Um, that's taking kind of like a big leap. That, that was published by Modern Drummer uh, in, uh, in 2014. And yeah, I'm kind of here now. I've been you know, still doing various playing, uh, not so much now because of COVID, you know, but uh, you know, yeah, that's 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 a bit of my my history. That's quite a story, my man. And <laughs> I I, re I remember one that that you shared with me that you were on the the band for a while, and that was Ricky Martin. That was quite a trip. oh yes, yeah. <laughs> yes, that was that was the late nineties. That was I was living La Vida Loca. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. Well, we know that uh, that you you were a part of our Jazz Zone The Beginning project. Yeah. And we were really thrilled that you contributed the lesson number six to our curriculum. 
Give us an outline of what you had hoped to accomplish with the lesson. Well, um, as, as you know, um, in, in trying, in those years we spent in the van room there at FIU, Florida yeah. International University, you know, working with the, the young drummers uh, yeah. there, one of the main things uh, for me was to try to communicate uh, the, the, the swing subdivision mm -hmm. and the ternary feel, uh, which means you know, triplets, rhythms that are in three. Um, trying to communicate that in a way that the young people could understand because really jazz is, is quite abstract. You know, when you think about the ride cymbal pattern and the way that it works, you know, and how the ride cymbal drives the time because lots of young people nowadays, you know, they're very bottom up, you know, they kind of approach the drum set from the bass drum going up through the rest of the drum set. But of course, jazz is the complete opposite where you kind of start with the cymbals and work your way back down through the rest of the drum set. So, um, I, you know, I gave it a lot of thought um, when you asked me about it. And it was, it, it, it kind of became clear to me a, a good way to approach it was just to start with the shuffle, with the, you know, just a, a straight blues shuffle. Because the subdivision of the sh shuffle pattern, the jazz swing pattern falls within that subdivision. So, I kind of felt like blues is pretty, everyone can pretty much understand the blues. Learning to get the feel of the blues in your shuffle on the drums goes a long way to helping you understand what, the, what jazz is, is supposed to feel like, even though you're not playing every subdivision. That feel, that motion, you know, that motion that, that's found within the dance um, is very important, you know, to be able to articulate that and generate that feel. I remember also um, you had some really good students there. Uh, yes. and, and one of them uh, that went on to, to be a pretty big success in New York, Lorraine Fainan. Yes, Lorraine, yes. <laughs> yes. She's done well. I've, I've not been in contact with her in many years, but yes, mm -hmm. Lorraine. Yes, Lorraine was a was a, a great drummer. I think she was working with Peebo Bryson. Yes, at one correct. point. Mm -hmm. I think the last time I spoke with her, which was not recently. <laughs> right. But right. Yes. Yeah, she was a good student. Yeah. Well, I can attest to many others that came through that that you really put the shine on. They they became really good people as well as good drummers. So right. you're uh, able to communicate very well. Now, we know that you have a really busy teaching schedule and performing career, as you say, with the, without the COVID problem. Uh, share with us some of the career highlights and what project you are working on or have planned in the near term. Okay. Uh... Well, career highlights, there, there, there are a couple. Um, most recently would definitely have to be Jeff Beck. Um, mm -hmm. For those of you who are not familiar with him, you'll want to go on YouTube and just type in his name and, and uh, you know, read, a, read a bit about Jeff. Um, you know, back in the 60s, there were three guitarists that came you know, out of England in kind of like the blues, kind of progressive blues rock. Um, genre of music. One was Eric Clapton, um, who was self-explained. Uh, the other was Jimmy Page from, the, he led the, um, uh, oh geez, I'm having another singer sing moment, uh, Led Zeppelin. He was the leader of Led Zeppelin. And then mm -hmm. there was Jeff Beck. And um, both uh, Jimmy Page and Jeff, they were in a band called the Yardbirds. And Jeff is just, continued to be an, a, a, an amazing musician and guitarist. And when I was 14 years old, uh, I had been playing in, in, um, in church really, you know, from, I started when I was six. So I was playing in church until I was 14. One day my brother came home with a big boom box on his, that was the day when you know, they <laughs> yeah. the boxes, boxes and they carried them on their shoulders. He was playing this music I had never heard before. And I stood there on the stairs and I was, I was just fascinated. 
And I asked him, I said, well, who is that? And he says, man, that's Jeff Beck Wired. So the, the name of that album we had on was Wired and the name of the song was a track called Sophie. I can remember it all, it's as clear as we're talking right now. And I stood there listening and in that moment, you know, I became, I, I was, I, my whole kind of like mind, I took, I took on a paradigm shift, I, I suppose. And I was in pursuit of improvisational music, you know, at, at that moment. So having in, 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 in all of my years with all of the people that I worked, that I've worked with and worked for, it never occurred to me that Jeff would be one of them. So mm -hmm. when, <laughs> when the opportunity presented itself for me to work with, with him, you know, it was, it was a bit of a no brainer. Um, and I spent five years as a member of his band and, Yes, definitely. I think of all the gigs that I've done, I think his has been the most um, rewarding and inspiring and, you know, all, all of those things. Um, so that's definitely a highlight. Uh, as far as things that are happening right now, I've been doing um, more kind of instructional videos uh, and promoting my book, um, Exercises in African American Fall, uh, for those of you who are interested. Um, doing online videos, things like this. Uh, mm -hmm. And also, uh, you know, sometimes people contact me and they want to, you know, uh, get bits of information on different things. And I haven't done really kind of like live tutorials or lessons with people like over the internet. But I, I do, if someone has a question about something, I'll just record a video and send, mm -hmm. send them the link. You know, and um, just work with things that way. And now that we're in kind of COVID land and no one can really get together, <laughs> you know, that <laughs> just seems right. to be the way to go. You know, it's, it's really quite bizarre. You know, music is such an exchange of energy and personalities that, that normally you do just within a few feet of one another. But that seems to be changing at the moment. And, you know, so I guess this is just everything changes. So this is another one of the changes. So uh, it's not my favorite thing, but it is what it is. <laughs> we're, we're all uh, feeling that same feeling. Yeah. You know, one of the questions that I've been asking the musicians that come on the uh, broadcast here is to relate some of their stories from the road. And I'm wondering if you could think of one or two that you might have had with Jeff Beck and his band. Yes, so I think it was back in, in 2017. Um, Jeff was celebrating his 50th anniversary in, in the music business. And we did a concert at the Hollywood Bowl. And, uh, you know, this was just like a, a profound moment for, for me because those of you who are familiar with Jan Hammer, uh, the keyboard player formerly with the Mahavishnu Orchestra. Um, he was with Billy Cobham. Then he went on, of course, to um, do the music for, for Miami Vice, the, the television, the mm -hmm. hit television series years ago. Um, but yes, yeah, so uh, we were in rehearsals and uh, Jeff told me that Jan was going to be joining us on, on stage, you know, to play basically music from uh, Jeff's albums Wired and There and Back and Blow by Blow, <laughs> which is, you know, just for me was, you know, I was just in heaven. <laughs> just, you know, it doesn't get much better than this. So, yeah, yeah that's, I, I, I think that's, that's, that's certainly a, a great story for me. He was such a nice guy, Jan. And just a tremendous player, yeah. And uh, there's video footage of that also that you can see online if you type in Jeff Beck, um, Hollywood Bowl 2017. You, know, you can go on and, and check that out. <laughs> good, good. Well, I'm sure there's others that you could share that uh, maybe we'll talk about after a while. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, listen, you're, you're in England. And, and yes. I know you have a place in England and you have a place in the United States. Uh, how does that work, man? Well, um, let's see. I, I, I met 
my wife um, back in 2003. I met my wife, Wendy, when I was hired to be the musical director for her daughter, who is Joss Stone. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar with Joss, she's a very famous English soul singer. Mm. And uh, I was hired by, by my friend, Betty Wright, who I mentioned earlier, to be her musical director. And um, over the course of the years of working for both of them, I suppose, you know, my wife was, uh, who, my wife now, we, we weren't married then, obviously, but um, my wife took over as Joss's is manager and I was kind of helping Wendy manage Joss because Joss was just 15 at the time and she never performed with a live band you know so mm. there, there were many things for her to learn so anyway to make a lo very long story short we, en we ended up getting together and we got married I think in 06 and it was in, in 04 I moved from Florida here to, to England and I've always still maintained, you know, a, a place in, in Florida as mm -hmm. well. But I, I was here probably for a good 10 or 11 years, really kind of working out of England mm -hmm. and um, you know, doing things. So I kind of like cut back on my touring, you know, during that, that time. I was m much more focused on trying to have a successful marriage. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> because as you know, the music business is a relationship destroyer. Well, that's all right. <laughs> <It's not. laughs> <laughs> so you know, uh, my wife is very understanding. So um, and and because it, we kind of have like a, a family of music, if you will. So mm -hmm. everyone's uh, you know of a, a certain mindset, which allows right. uh, things to be able to work. You know, it's very very difficult when when people don't understand certain things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jonathan. Uh, Band directors here, and I'm sure in England as well, are currently facing challenges as they plan to reopen their schools and prepare for a restructured classroom. Um, can you share with us some basics of how they might approach working with their drumming students in this environment? I, I'm, I'm sorry, you're, you're, the, the audio is just breaking up a bit. Could you just repeat that for me? Sure. Uh, band directors are are currently facing challenges as they plan reopening and preparing uh, for their restructured classrooms mm -hmm. uh, in this COVID uh, nature. Uh, would you share with us some of the basics, how they might approach working with their drumming students? Well, um, in, in the actual band situation, you know, where if, if you're working with a big band, um, I think in terms of the rhythm section, it's, it's not really an issue because, you know, they kind of recommend six feet apart. Mm -hmm. And un unlike the, the rest of the big band, you know, uh, you can kind of spread the, the rhythm section out and, and, and still be close enough to have the intimacy, but not so close that you're kind mm -hmm. of in danger of being infected. Um, but it's a bit different with the horn section, you know, I would imagine, um, in that they're, the horns are really right on top of each other, um, you know. Um, but it, it, as far as uh, working in, in like a private you know, situation, even that's, it, it's not so bad. I, I don't see the issue really being with, with drumming so much. Mm -hmm. Because even if you have like, you know, two, uh, you know, the teacher and the student with two drum sets, the drum sets aren't normally right next to each other, you know, in a way that's going to put you right on top of your teacher, you know, so you can just move the drums away. And of course, there's always enough volume with the drums so that everything is heard. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so I've had those drummers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, listen, man, I know that you are well versed in all styles of jazz drumming. And you have a very special background that has formed the foundation of your drumming. Uh, perhaps you could give us uh, an idea of where that came from and uh, eventually give us a, a demonstration on your kit of the, the information you're sharing. 
Yes. Um, so I, I started playing in church. You know, uh, I was playing drums. I started playing when I was six, and my mother was the choir directors, and my two sisters played piano and organ. Mm-hmm. And I, I was on the drums, so it was kind of like the Joseph family was responsible for all the music in the church. And of course, you know, back back then, this we're talking kind of like early 70s, 73, 74, uh, is, when I, is when I started. Um, you know, gospel music wasn't as progressive as it is now, mm-hmm. but it, I think it was kind of going through a transition in that there was more jazz harmony being introduced to the gospel idiom. So um, over the years, kind of like from the mid 70s, uh, up, up until now, there's been a steady fl- uh, stream of influence of jazz uh, being uh, uh, played within the context of gospel music. And of course, now specifically with drumming, um, you know, years, years ago, gospel drummers didn't really have chops. You know, uh, no one really studied rudiments or, or took that type of approach to drumming. But of course, now one of the most popular drumming styles is gospel chops. You know, all over the world, people are playing gospel music and 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 implementing rudiments on the drum set in a particular you know, type of way. Um, so yeah, that's that's my foundation, and 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 having that. You know, and, and playing spiritual music, you know, you're dealing with, this, again, the, the subdivision of three, the ternary subdivision uh, in 12-8 and 6-8. And, you know, those things really, for me, kind of led me right into jazz when I was introduced to Jeff Beck and, you know, his album Wired. And, that, and when I started, you know, moving into improvisational music, I found that I kind of had a very good understanding of the of those subdivisions already, and I've been playing them for years. It was just a kind of a different application to take um, to to kind of accent different partials of the triplet, which were necessary, you know, to create you know the jazz swing feel mm-hmm. and that kind of traditional uh, bebop kind of way. All yeah. right. So let's listen to Jonathan, and I think he's going to share some more ideas with you as he plays. Hi, I'm Jonathan Joseph, and today we're just going to discuss a few techniques and ideas uh, to help uh, educators speak to their drum students with a view to helping them develop a nice solid jazz feel and approach. Now the jazz feel can be a bit abstract uh, you know, for a young person who hasn't really had that much experience playing jazz. So I recommend the following. You start by developing a good consistent blues shuffle feel. And of course we all know what that is. Sounds a bit like this. One, two, three. shuffle. Now, within that feel, you have everything that exists in terms of the jazz feel. It's just kind of looking at it, thinking of subtraction from the ride symbol pattern. Instead of playing the third and first partials of the triplet, we're going to diversify that pattern, you know, a little bit. So the normal uh, blue shuffle pattern is one, two, three, And then the standard spangling pattern for jazz is this one, two, three, four. Okay, now. 
But then the blue shuffle pattern, the jazz spangle spangling pattern exists. I'll play both of them for you, kind of going back and forth. One, two, three, four. Okay, so that basically uh, establishes what we're doing and how we're going to do it. Okay, now let's get into a little bit more detail about the articulation of the patterns and the notes. Okay, so in the blues shuffle, we really are primarily accenting two and four uh, in between the other partials of the triplets that we're playing. I think that you can also see on my bass drum uh, when we're playing blues, the bass drum is played more aggressively. <coughs> Excuse me. In this, in, in this case, keeping the, the four on the floor, that pulse needs to be very strong when you're playing in a blues band. It's a little bit different uh, when you're playing in a jazz band, but for now we'll just focus on the blues aspect of this. And with the left hand, we're just going to copy the same pattern that we're playing on the right hand but accenting two and four. Okay, so here we go. One, two, three, four. Okay, I'll play that a little bit faster this time for a slightly different feel. One, two, three. midway through what I was playing. Okay, the hi-hat in jazz is normally played on two and four and also just as a conceptual idea you have the time runs differently in jazz as opposed to blues and other types of music. And what I mean by that is that in blues, R&B, rock, your bass drum really drives the pulse of the rhythm. But of course in jazz the ride cymbal, start, the pulse starts with the ride cymbal works its way down through the hi-hat and then through the rest throughout the rest of the kit. So it's really important that your ride cymbal pattern is really strong, very consistent in the articulation and the way that you phrase the, the triplets. Okay? So now um, let's look at a bit of the, the actual jazz pattern um, while playing the two and four on the high on the hi-hat as well. We got one, two, three, four. That's the basic uh, jazz feel, and there are a couple of things about the articulation of the riot symbol that you might want to pay uh, close attention to, and this will really help your, your uh, students uh, begin to be able to phrase and be able to kind of like just the beginnings of being able to interact not only with themselves in terms of the drum kit, but also with the other instrumentalists in the band. So 
dig into the, the, the right symbol pattern a bit further, there are basically three different ways to articulate the spangling pattern. The first is with having the accent on the downbeats, which sounds like this. <laughs> So there I'm actually accenting uh, beats one and three on the pattern, right? Okay, the other, uh, another variation of that is to accent the, um, the triplet here. So this is actually on the second, uh, I'm sorry, the third partial of beat two. It's actually on the third partial of beats two and then on beat four also. Okay, so one, two, three, four. Okay, and then of course the third way is to accent the two and four, which is the same rhythm that's uh, being articulated on the hi-hat with the left foot, okay? So that would sound like this. One, two, three, four. Okay, so I'll just run through those in sequence. One, two, three, four. Okay, so those are the three patterns. You'll be able to help your students um, if you can kind of explain to them what I'm explaining to you. Uh, <clears throat> and this will uh, really go a long way to help, helping them to be able to develop uh, the right feel you know, in jazz and to be able to just to understand you know, the very abstract nature of, of uh, you know, playing time and keeping a good jazz feel. your students to do is to just keep a nice strong and steady quarter note pulse.
it. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to contact me. Uh, I believe my information is on the website, and um, you know you can reach out to me, and I will respond. Uh, it might take some time, but then if you know if I get to your message quickly, then you know I'll, I'll respond as soon as I see it. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, continue to swing. Jonathan, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you being with us today and seeing you after all these years that we spent together and sharing your insights with our uh, viewers. We appreciate you being part of the Jazz Zone team and look forward to future instruction and interaction with you. Good luck, my friend. Thank you, Dick. It's good to see you again, and God bless you, and stay safe. <laughs> Same to you. Alrighty. To our viewers, we appreciate you joining us today and for being part of Jazz Zone Together. We hope you found the presentation of real value. We hope you'll join us for future episodes. In the meantime, please stay safe and please keep making music.